Hey, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's edition of Claims Corner. We are here live at our corporate office in Mobile, Alabama. And um, for me, I'm David James. I'm the property training manager here at CNC. And we're going to, today's topic, we're going to talk about ethics and how that plays into the adjuster's role. Uh, today we have Mr. Uh, Terry Sutton with us. He is going to elaborate on that topic. He's well known, well respected throughout the claim industry. And I'm going to let him uh, give us a little background on himself and, and let him take it from there. Sorry. Thank you, David. Hello, everybody. I'm not sure where you are across the country, but this is something I do a lot. Uh, for the past 15 years, I've been teaching uh, insurance professionals and uh, I've sort of migrated to teaching more ethics and customer service than anything else. And it's glad to I'm glad to be able to do that today. By the way, I'll tell you that this uh, this presentation is from a three hour presentation that we do uh, called Navigating Insurance Ethics. Uh, we we do seminars online uh, free uh, for uh, for adjusters. And if you want to be a part of, of a class that gives you actual CE credit, then you can join us on one of those classes uh, through our website. Our website is stevensengineering.com and then forward slash education. And we have classes you can register online and we'll get you all hooked up. And we have, uh, we have two different seminars we do, both at three hours long. This class, Navigating Insurance Ethics, today is sort of the, the abridged version of uh, the three hour seminar that I do. So if I, if I go over a couple of hours, David, you need to slow me down. So I want to thank uh, Jeremiah and Ashley and David and Julie Ward for putting this on. I'm glad to uh, be able to do this. Uh, we live in Florida, but I'm from Mobile. And so this is like my old stomping grounds. And I'm glad to be able to do this today. So I apologize if I look at you for a minute, then look down. Uh, my monitor is in front of me. So uh, please don't please don't have a bad feeling about me that I'm not making eye contact with you. So let's, let's keep going with this. Um, as I said, this is a 45 minute portion of a three hour seminar. And so I was telling my wife, I said, this is sort of like giving them a skeleton and not giving any flesh or, uh, you know, meat. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so this is actually a picture of my wife and I on our last date. And, uh, but she looked a whole lot better when you put skin and meat on it. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the best I can with this skeleton presentation today. There she is again. All right. Well, what I do in my, in my typical three-hour presentation, we have, we have a number of classes, about 15 classes that we do. Uh, we're in, in 12 states uh, that, that offer CE credit. Of course, most everybody is either going to be Texas or Florida or Georgia, but uh, Alabama's catching up. We do classes for Alabama as well, and uh, I do these classes all the time, and so we, we took our ethics classes and re revamped them this year, and we use a little di different motif. As you can see on the screen, uh, I'm going to use uh, the Mississippi River as an analogy about uh, your life as an insurance professional and uh, how ethics applies to you. So um, Gilligan's Island is going to have a two hour tour and uh, you, you know, we're going to have a short tour uh, going down the river. I mean, what could happen? You know, you know Gilligan's Island, two hour tour that lasted for seven seasons. So my stomach, Jared Bonfield, my stomach was in the way. So I backed up a little bit. All right, well, let's get going with this. When we talk about ethics, and by the way, I'm not sure where you are, uh, you know, what states uh, you're you're working in right now, uh, where your license is, but I can tell you this, in every state of the union, there is a requirement for an insurance professional to comport themselves ethically. And um, you, you have a responsibility to live up to the insurance code of your state. In fact, uh, the, the ethics for insurance professionals is on really on three levels. You see the little diagram here. The lowest one is the insurance code, which is a, which is a, a broad, um, you know, if you've ever, ever read one of those, you would think it was the worst thing you ever read in your life. I had to do a conference in Texas, and I was doing, doing it with the lead prosecutor for the Department of Insurance, who I, who I learned I need to keep him close to me. You know, if he, so if I ever got in trouble, I could call on him. But we were doing a conference and every time we would talk, you know, in subsequent conferences, he would say the main reason that people call the insurance department to complain against an adjuster is customer service. Somebody did something wrong. Somebody didn't tell them enough. 
uh, somebody uh, was rude to them and uh, didn't return a phone call or email. So I just want to remind you that, that there's this ethical component to what we do in insurance. You're, you're not called an insurance employee. You're called an insurance professional. And there's a standard that is being held up for you to, to live by. And uh, that standard is, is elucidated with the, with the ethics requirements. And the basic insurance code uh, of any particular state is, is written in lawyer speak. But if you read, if you read you know, through it and try to digest it a little bit, it's all about how you treat other people. That's what ethics is. And then when you work for a, a good company like CNC and who, who works with, uh, with great carriers, uh, you're probably given a employee handbook and they define, they define more closely for you what you're supposed to do as an insurance professional. That would be the code of conduct. Or um, in some states, there's actually, like in Georgia, for instance, there's actually a separate document called the code of ethics that spells out what you're supposed to do. There's also national implications. There's federal laws with fair trade and, and, uh, and the customer, uh, you know, the way you deal with the customers. And uh, so there's a lot of rules that are out there. Almost always when you hear an ethics class, it's all about the rules, all about law. In Florida, if your license is in Florida, you know that there's a requirement. It used to be five hours, now it's four hours, uh, ethics and law. And uh, as, as if the only requirement of ethics is to, is to obey the law. Th that is a very, very juvenile perspective on it. And I think probably one day Florida will, will change that a little bit. But the fact is, law is only one portion of ethics. It's a whole lot more. And that's why I boil this down, not just the insurance code and not just the code of conduct, but moral code. That is where the water hits the wheel. If you're ever deposed and uh, you're confronted with, uh, with the powers that be uh, in the insurance department of a given state, um, one of the things they're going to be mindful of is, did you do what a normal person would do? Did you comport yourself in a way that was rational and, uh, and prudent? And uh, it's like playing golf. Were, were you making pars more often than you were making bogeys? And, uh, and there's no, there's no uh, expectation if you have birdies or, or you know, eagles when you do this, but uh, just, just maintain status quo. If you will do that, you'll be well protected. And that's why it's so important for each of us to have a, have a strong moral code. And that's what this class is all about. So I'm, I'm gonna compare the three and then we'll, we'll get into it. First of, all, first of all, using the Mississippi River, by the way, it's 2,344 miles long. It goes from, from uh, Lake Itasca in Minnesota all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And, uh, and the, the beginnings of the, of the Mississippi River are very inauspicious. And if you ever wondered why the Mississippi River is where it is, or why the other tributaries at the end of the Mississippi River are where they are. Well, they're where they are because they follow floodplains. And so insurance code is like this big, broad uh, floodplain. And, uh, and rivers change their course over time. But by and large, they're going to stay inside that floodplain. And the insurance code is like the river valley or the floodplain. And so understand, you have a responsibility to live up to the insurance code of your particular state. Unfortunately, most of you have never read the insurance code of your particular state, and so that puts you at a disadvantage. And that's why they have people like me teach classes like this to help you sort of understand and digest what it is you're supposed to do and not do. And so here's a picture of, uh, of, the, of the United States. And you'll see the, the river valley, uh, the Mississippi River Valley is very precise. All, all the rain that falls on the east side of the Rockies goes to the Mississippi River eventually. All the rain that fall, falls on the west side of the Appalachians go to the Mississippi River. And so the Mississippi River drains a huge part of our country, but the inauspicious beginnings uh, really don't tell the whole story. When the Mississippi River empties into the Gulf of Mexico, it's the third largest river in the world as far as volume of water that's emptied into a, a ocean or a gulf. And what makes Mississippi River what it is, it's not its beginning, but it's the tributaries along the way. And I'm gonna suggest to you, you may have had a major beginning as an insurance professional. And, uh, and as you go, uh, you learn more, you, you adjust, you, uh, you know, just in life. Uh, when we start as little children helpless, you know, there's not much we can do. We're completely dependent upon our, our parents. But as we go in life, the, a lot of things 
are added to us that make us who we are. And so I don't know who you are. I know who I am. And, uh, and I, I look back at my life and recognize that there are a number of things that have been instrumental in me becoming the person that I am. And uh, those are, we'll just call them for this presentation, tributaries. I hope that communicates to you. Um, and the broad, this broad floodplain includes fair trade laws and other things like that. And uh, you, you probably have never read, like I said, the insurance code or even the fair trade laws, but your company has been very good, I'm sure, in helping you understand some specifics about what it means to be ethical in the insurance world. If you ever want to know what the insurance code is for your particular state, here's a slide right here. Every, every state's insurance code and code of, code of ethics, if there is one for the particular state, is included in this website. So we, the uh, Julie or David or Jeremiah or Ashley, whoever it might be, can make, make this available to you, or you can look that up if you, if you really want to know. All right. The, the second element of, um, of ethics is not just the insurance code, the broad floodplains, but the next element is the riverbank. And so the rivers are, con are confined to riverbanks unless there's a flood. And for many of you, that's why you're out doing what you do. But the riverbank sort of keeps the river in check. It is the, uh, the code of ethics for your particular company, and they help define for you what you're supposed to do. There's a nice riverbank right there. And typically, rivers flow down the riverbank. Uh, I was telling my wife as we drove over here, we, we live in, in uh, Navarre, Florida, which is near Destin. And uh, so we, we cross over rivers on the way here. And I was telling her the funny thing about rivers is that almost always the, the uh, state lines between states are rivers. The problem with it, rivers change their course, just like the Mississippi River has changed its course from time to time. And I was telling tell her about when you go from Alabama to Mississippi and back, you cross the Escataba River. And now when you cross and it says, welcome to Mississippi, you're still about a mile from the Escataba River. Well, what happened? Well, what happened was over time, the river changed its course. And, uh, and so that happens with us. As we, as we grow as people, as we grow as insurance professionals, things change over time. There's some things I believe, you know, hold and I hold to today that I didn't just 10 or 15 years ago. We're always, you know, dynamic in, in, um, in understanding how we relate to the world around us. Well, that's that's a riverbank. And uh, your company may give you something like this. A gentleman sitting at a desk with a pen pointing to you, this is the code of ethics for this company, and uh, this is what you're expected to do. And um, so with that in mind, I want to ask you a question. And, and actually, it's rhetorical because you can't respond to me. Uh, but you guys hit this room can if you want to. If I was to ask you, well, actually, I'm getting ready to do that very thing. When I ask you, how do you define ethics? What, how do you define that? I mean, you are, you are required to comport yourself ethically. Well, how do you, how do you define that? How, if somebody asks you, you're supposed to be ethical, what does that mean? I mean, what do you say? And uh, so there, we have to decide what the, what the definition of ethics is. And uh, in fact, this little guy on the screen is pondering that. What is the definition of ethics? So I'm, I'm glad you asked that, because if I, if I ask you, you're in, in this room, we, we would banter back and forth. People would say things like, like I did this last week for, uh, for a company down in, La in uh, Fort Lauderdale. And then two days before that, I did it for, for Bankers Insurance Company uh, based in uh, St. Petersburg for all of their property people. And we, I asked the question, how do you define it? I got all kinds of things. Do the right thing, you know. Um, you know, be kind. You know, obey the rules. Mm -hmm. But but very seldom do people come up with the real the real essence of what ethics is, and uh, that's why I have this this help now from uh, from Webster. Ethics is a discipline dealing with what is good and bad, with moral duty and obligation. It's a set of moral principles or values, the principles of conduct governing an individual or a group. I want to suggest to you, it is impossible to have uh, ethics without morals. And so you may think, well, that's unusual. Uh, our government, we have laws and rules, and um, surely that's not based on morals. And if you said that, you would be absolutely wrong because all of our rules are based on morals, somebody's morals. And, uh, and the, the question is, whose morals are you going to abide by? 
as an insurance professional, you're required to comport yourself ethically. And that means that you have a moral code that, that you use to synthesize the other rules that have been given you. All right. I just want to tell you, ethics is simply not the law. If you think that just keeping the rules is, uh, is being ethical, uh, you are sadly mistaken. There, there are a lot of rules that are not good rules. And uh, not, not ethics rules, of course. I'm talking about other rules in the world. Uh, ju just obeying the rules is not enough. You know, that's, that's not what a prudent person would do. A prudent person would understand what's happening in a given situation. For instance, I'm sure you never speed, Davis, that you're sitting there looking at me. <laughs> I'm sure you never go over the speed limit. Of course not. And, uh, and it's a rule. You, you cannot go over the speed limit. And if you do, um, you know, you may have to pay a price for that. And the question is, do you have a right to be wrong? And the answer is, you sure do. You have a right to be wrong. People always talk about rights. You have a right for this or a right for that, but you have a right to be wrong. And, uh, and, and in fact, there's a lot of wrongs that we all do and we, we are corrected. So I wanna talk about the, um, the well, this is Aristotle, one of my favorite uh, modern philosophers. So educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. That's why you really can't have an ethics class without talking about morals. And so I want to talk about the, uh, the five tributaries that add to your morals. These are things in your life and uh, as a professional, insurance professional, as a, as a person, these are the five things that contribute to make you who you are. And so I'm, I'm going to just, uh, obviously, this is, uh, we, have, we have a short time to do this. I, I feel like a mummy press for time. <laughs> if I haven't explained my jokes, it's going to be a long 30 minutes as well. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the tributaries of ethics. There are five tributaries that contribute to make us who we are. The first one is our, our sense of authority or law. Uh, what, what, is, uh, what is your feeling about authority and law? Let's face it, we have all kinds of opinions today. You can turn the TV on anytime and hear all about anarchists who don't want to have any kind of laws or rules. But the fact is, we do have laws and rules. You have rules that govern what you do as, a, as an insurance professional. And, um, and then you have, and many of them are very, are very gray, and you have to add, you know, have to add some, some color and texture to that to make it apply to your life. But the fact is, we all, we're all under authority, we're all under, under the law of gravity. We're, you know, my feet are on the ground right now. I would have been a great basketball player, except, you know, I played, I played ball. And uh, I was a 205 pound linebacker and uh, six foot, and I could barely dunk a tennis ball. I couldn't dunk a basketball. And the problem was there was this law that governed me, and that was the law of uh, law of gravity. I was so glad to find out there's a greater law than that called the law, law of aerodynamics that uh, helps me be able to get in a plane and fly. Didn't help me in basketball though, <laughs> although I could shoot free throws very well either. But the fact is, we're all, we all have a, a sense of law and authority. And when we violate the things that we know are true, then we may get to meet a governmental official. And uh, just like what happens with the, with the Department of Insurance in a particular state, if we do something that's wrong, you may actually get to talk to somebody uh, with, that, with that department. So every time there's one of these tributaries, there's a codifying entity. And one of those is it keeps us in line are people who, who hold us to the laws that govern us. And like I said, you can speed anytime you want to. You, it's not me giving you freedom. You have the freedom to do that. Speed all you want to. But you might get to meet uh, somebody with a blue flashing light who will give you a nice note that requires you to pay money. And so the, you, can, you can do what you want to, but our, there is a restraint in our lives. And part of that restraint are the codifying entities that with law and authority is the government typically governmental entities. The second tributary of ethics is what I call spirituality. It's inescapable that you and I are spiritual beings. And, um, you know, people always want, want to argue about the fact that, um, that we need to have a separation between, between the church and state. Uh, if you if you hold to that, you, you didn't really read the the uh, articles that were written by James Madison and, and Thomas Jefferson. It, it means that we shouldn't have a religion that we're told to have to have a certain religion and that the government dictates what we do. Some countries, that's the way it is. 
they dictate what religion you are. You very, you know, you vary from that, and there's a price to be paid sometimes with your head. But the fact is, we're all spiritual beings. And if I ask you the question, where do our laws come from in America? You might know what's, what's the moral code that our laws are based on. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> uh, the answer is, our laws in America are based on British common law, and that's what that's where the inception for our laws came from from that culture. But where does the where does the moral code for British common law come from? Again, great question. I'll answer that. Is from the Ten Commandments, the the laws of Great Britain and many other countries of the world are based on a moral code, a, an established moral code, the Ten Commandments. Our laws here in America are based on, uh, you know, indirectly the Ten Commandments. If you go to Washington, D.C. and go to the Supreme Court and you think there should be a separation of church and state, you'll be bothered because on the front door are the Ten Commandments. You go into the judges' chambers and behind the judges' chambers are the Ten Commandments on the back wall. Why? because there must be some moral basis for the laws that are that we have. I used to debate on college campuses. In fact, I'm from Mobile, and I can, I can remember uh, debates I had at South Alabama uh, when I was youth minister and, and student minister at a church here, and people want to argue that you can't legislate morality. And, uh, and I would just, I try not to be unkind, you know, roll my eyes and, and go, you're dumb as a brick. I, I wouldn't, usually do that, but the fact is that our laws are based on a moral code. Why do you think it says that shall not, you know, you, you should, you shouldn't kill somebody because the Ten Commandments says you shall not murder, should not kill, take somebody's life. There are exceptions. The, the, uh, the state is, uh, is seen in one light and then those under authority under the state are seen in another light. Uh, one of my sons is an Air Force pilot and the first time, his first tour of duty uh, he met on the way out, le leaving the Far East, the Eastern, where he was. Uh, he had to meet with the commanding officer for that for that um, for that wing, and and they gave him his kill list. They gave him a list of all the kills that he had. For the first time, he realized that all those things that were blown up and people that were being killed that, was, that wasn't a video game; it was a real real person. And uh, and his first the first time he he his first tour had 92 kills. And that's just confirmed kills. And, uh, and he's very, he's a big six, five guys, a great, just one of the greatest people in the world, but he, but it, it bothered him. Oh my gosh, I have killed people. Am, am I, you know, am I uh, guilty of murder? And so when he got back, we had this big conversation. We had to talk about the fact that he is under authority and when, and he is a man under authority he's required to, to act under authority. And it's authority's responsibility to pay the price for that, not him. And so there, there's a lot of things that we that we do we may not agree with, but we would be we're under authority, and so we maintain those rules. But we are spiritual beings, and we all have a sense of you know what's right or wrong. Almost always, our our spirituality is codified by a church or by a religion. Even if you are a if, if you're a humanist, you believe that man is God, and uh, which is I love talking to people who think man is God is wonderful. I, I love thinking about them going into their bathrooms, looking in the mirror and singing how great thou art to themselves, you know, because they're God. You know, everybody has a God. Everybody worships something. Almost always it's codified with a religion or a church. Even, even humanism, according to the Supreme Court, is a religion. So the worship of man is a religion. We're all spiritual beings. And so our spirituality, whatever it might be, helps to make us who we are. The, the third uh, element, tributary, is culture. Culture is how we're raised. You know, were you raised by two loving parents, one loving parent? You know, uh, were you raised as, a, as an orphan? You were raised with, in a bad situation? You were raised by grandparents or aunts or uncles? You know, we're, we're raised, that, that's where we learn how to function in society. Uh, and the home determines that. The way those first six years are formative. And the way, the way we're raised there uh, sets us on a course of life for how, how we relate to people in society. Of course, it can all change. I know people who, who were raised in the most horrendous way you can ever imagine, and yet they turned out and they were able to relate, you know, relate well in society. You know, there, there's always a chance for beginning again. There's always a way to overcome the negatives of our lives. So the fact is, uh, culture is a, big, is a big component of who we are. 
and our and our ethic. And when when uh, there's a distress from from the past, there's ways to overcome that. The next element is conscience, and I just throw that in to say that we all have an innate sense of what's right and wrong. And so you now you can't really do that in a court of law. Well, it seemed right to me at the time. That may not you know play too well when there are laws that you're that you're violating. But the fact that is we all have an innate sense of right and wrong. We we have a law written on our hearts. And um, the, the first law written on our hearts is the law of me and mine. And my kids, I didn't have to send my kids to sin school. They were very good at that. And um, and everything was about themselves. You know, here they are, the world circles around them. And uh, that's very, very rudimentary. But the fact is, we all have a sense of right and wrong for them. Uh, they And I'll show you this uh, Kohlberg's uh, personality thing in just a minute where we talk about decision making. But the fact is that a, a child makes a decision based on not getting hurt. You know, the, it used to be you could spank children. You know, now we take things away, which also also hurts. But kids have an innate sense of right and wrong. And their, their first thing is survival. I don't want to be hurt. I, I want what I want. I want mine. And that, that's a part of the uh, of the uh, tributary of of culture that, that affects our lives, of, of conscious affects our lives. Well, when I have a few minutes, let me know and I'll try to cut the baloney off. Okay. All right. The uh, the last one is science. And, I, and I, I, I throw this in to say there are a lot of things that we do, but not because we'd made the discovery that we should do this, but somebody else did. Like we, I was going to say, if you go to the bathroom, when you go to the bathroom, I know you go to the bathroom. But when you go to the bathroom, what's the last thing you do before you leave the bathroom? And, and for all of us, normal people, is you wash your hands. Well, why do you wash your hands? Do you look down and see cooties crawling on your hand? I mean, you no, know, we do that because we know there's pathogens and, there, and there's germs and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's filth and dirt and microbes. And by washing our hands, we wash those away. And, and, uh, and it's a very important thing to do. And so science gives us knowledge. And these five, these five tributaries contribute to make us who we are. And so here they are again. Here's the five tributaries. These are the five main ones to the Mississippi River. Red River, Arkansas River, Missouri River, Ohio River, and Tennessee River. And uh, now there are many others. There, there are 23 major tributaries you know, beyond just these five. And there are hundreds and hundreds of other tributaries that empty into the Mississippi River. So the tributaries are a big part of who we become. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, part, part of our becoming who we are is we, we submit ourselves to teaching and learning from other people and uh, a class maybe like this. So let's talk about the moral code because th this is where the water hits the wheel. Uh, if the insurance code is the floodplains or river valleys and the, and the code of conduct is the river banks, the moral code is the channel. We've got to main, you got to stay in the channel. And, um, you know, if you don't, if you don't, you can have a lot, lot, a lot of problems. There's a nice channel right there. You know, I'm not sure which one that is, but the Mississippi River uh, starts, like I said, Lake Itasca. That is the headwaters right there of Lake Itasca. I actually walked across that. So, yes, I walked across the Mississippi River and because uh, I knew where the rocks were. And, um, but very inauspicious beginnings, the tributaries into our lives make us who we are. And it's a, it's a lifelong process. I'm a, I'm a, I was young and now I'm old. And, uh, and there are things that I believe today that I didn't believe five or six years ago. I mean, it's, we're always in process here. So I'm just gonna mention, mention this. This is Kohlberg's stages of moral development and, and uh, decision-making. All of us make decisions based on our, you know, the, the tributaries into our lives. So let me just mention real quick, the, the very basic stage is I don't, I, I, I do it so I don't get in trouble. So a lot of people do that. That's, that's, that's the whole canvas of their life. I don't want to get in trouble. That's why I do what I do. That, that is the reasoning of a child. The second level is I do it so I get something out of it. So there's some, some reward. Now we all want rewards. That's, that's a very important, you know, aspect of our lives. And children can be can be you know can be governed by giving rewards. It's a very it's a very good thing. My, my little puppy responds to that. The third stage is I do so you'll like me. I, I, I'm gonna do what I do so that you so that you'll so we'll get along. And uh, that's again that's a very rudimentary uh, reason for doing what you do. The fourth reason is 
I do it because it's the law and I respect the law. And um, which is that that is like the zero tolerance policy in a lot of places that where there's no thinking or rationing or, uh, or trying to understand a particular nuance of the situation. It's just that's the law. That's the way it is. And uh, we're going to stick by that again. That's that is not the highest level of decision making. Level five is I do it because of the social contract that we have with each other. That's a very high level. In fact, it is called the post conventional level. It's a very high level. I, I do it because we're all in this together. You know, we're, we're all part of, uh, of mankind and and we should give respect to one another. I, we should give as much respect to a janitor as we do the CEO. And, uh, you know, I hope you were taught that. And if not, I hope you're doing that now. But the highest level of decision making is I do it because it's the right thing to do. And uh, so we get right back to a moral code. What is right and wrong? How, how do we define that? Well, there's a lot of things on the river, in the rivers of our life that we have to be aware of. And in my class, I go into great detail about this. And it's very interesting. Too bad you're going to miss that. Join, you know, go online and sign up for a class. But there are things like oxbow lakes, point bars, uh, shallows, um, obstructions and eddies, and, um, and all those kind of things along the river. So a lot of things can knock us out of the channel. So we got to be prepared for that. And I'm going to share a couple of things about that in just a minute. But this reminds me, there are two, two boats uh, going down the channel, different directions. One was carrying red paint, others was carrying blue paint. They collided. And all the sailors got marooned. Sorry. I just want to see if you're paying attention real quick. OK. All right. The fact is, nobody, nobody determines your moral code but you. You are the captain of your ship. And uh, there's your ship now. You know, you're not, you're the captain, not the crew, but you are the captain. If you ever go uh, in a deposition or, or have some sort of challenge about something you've done, uh, you're going to be weighed out, not what other people said, not what other people did, but you. You are the captain of your ship. So let me talk about how to be a good captain in the time we have remaining, and uh, which is how much time we have remaining, David. Yeah. Fifteen minutes, so you need to listen very fast for these things. Here are six things to help you, you know, be a good captain of your ship. Number one is you need to focus on the channel markers. I have a boat. We live on we live on the the Sound, uh, the Santa Rosa Sound, and there there are these big signs. And they're red on you know they're red and they're green, and uh, and between the two are the channel. I never understood what. You know, what I did, did I stay on the right side, the left side to go down the middle? What do I do? The interesting thing is about the channel is the green, the green markers are the are the side where the river's flowing to uh, to open water. The red markers are where the river uh, is going against the river flowing to open to uh, to open sea. And so it can be, it depends on where you are, red or green can be on different sides. You got, you got to sort of maintain vigilance to know where you are and uh, where you're supposed to stay in navigating the channel. Second thing about being a good captain is you have to be honest about you. And I'm going to do something that I, that I do uh, in my class, and we go into great depth, but I'm going to introduce it to you, and you'll want to take our class so you can take this test. Um, this, you know who this guy is? His name is Samuel Longhorn Clemens, but he's also known as Mark Twain. Mark Twain uh, got his name. He was a river captain as a, as a teenager, older teenager. He was a river captain, and they had to make sure the water was deep enough on the Mississippi River to uh, to operate the the stern wheeler. And they would drop they would drop this marker down to measure the depth, and they wanted it needed to be 12 feet deep, and a a fathom is is six feet. And so they wanted to be two fathoms deep. And so when they were when they would drop the marker down, if it was two fathoms deep, deep, they would yell out Mark Twain. And that's where he got so that's what he got his name. I think it's interesting though, we should always take stock of ourselves and uh, examine ourselves and see how deep the water is. Just because the, the water is uh, muddy doesn't mean it's deep. You know what I mean? And so we need to always check ourselves. Uh, the unexamined life is not worth living, according to this guy named Socrates, who was on Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> okay, am I dating myself here? <laughs> At my age, it's the only person I can date. All right. 
So I want, I want to talk just a minute about you. And so I hope you take this personal because it really is. Everybody in this picture, 1938, is, is saluting Adolf Hitler, the guy who was, who, was an, who was evil and who was wrong. And everybody's saluting him except for one person. And I'd like to know who that guy was. He's got his arms folded with a scowl on his face. And uh, legend has it that, that uh, the next picture, he wasn't in it. And so you understand, sometimes we've got to go against the grain and go against everybody else. We've got to do what is right and, you know, according to our moral code. So I want to talk about uh, how to know you a little bit better. This is called the cube test. You ever done this, anybody? It's the coolest thing in the, in the world. And we're going to do this very fast, so, so go with me. If you have a pencil and a piece of paper, I want, you to, I want you to do something. If not, I want you to activate your imagination and, uh, and sort of go with me on this. This is called the cube test, developed in, in Japan, and there's many other uh, aspects of this now, and uh, different things are used. But it is amazing how accurate this could de depict a person's uh, moral code, a person's, uh, person's life. So the first thing I want you to do, I want you to imagine a field, a very large field. I'm not going to define it any more than that, just a very large field. And, um, and so picture that. And so if you have a piece of paper, I guess you could make the, the piece of paper is your field. Although you could draw a you know a horizon or something to, to, uh, to give some limits to it, but you, there's a field, okay? The second thing I want you to, to visualize or write down is in the field is a cube. I'm not going to define it any more than that. There's a cube in the field. And uh, a cube is a six-sided, is that six? Yeah, a six-sided, uh, you know, box, for instance. So there's a cube in the field. I want you to visualize the cube. And, uh, and so, and think about it, okay? I have, there's a cube, where is it? Is it, um, what's it made of? Can you see through it? Is it, was it, is it made of steel? I mean, what is it? I want you to just visualize the cube and so be thinking about that because I'm going to give a definition to it in just a minute. The third thing is uh, near your cube is a ladder. So I want you to draw a ladder in your, in your field uh, where the cube is. Just draw a ladder. What kind of ladder is it? There's all kinds of ladders. As an adjuster, you know, the kind, you know what I'm talking about. There, there's, the, there's the extension ladders. There's the A-frame there's the ladder. There's the ones you fold out now and, and uh, you got the little giant, the big giant, and and uh, everything in between. And uh, but what a ladder! Just just there's a ladder. So you have a ladder in your field where the cube is. The next thing is um, where your cube is. There's now a ladder. And the next thing is uh, a horse. Whoops, I got ahead of myself. A horse is now in the field. So just do a stick horse, okay? Don't don't try to be uh, you know artsy with it. Just there's a horse in the field. So draw a horse. And um, whatever, whatever comes to your mind, uh, what, what, you know, what, what color is it? Does it have a mane? Does it have a saddle? Does it have a bridle? Is it, is it, is it galloping? Is it feeding? Is it going away from you? Is it coming to you? Just, just a horse in the field. First thing that comes to your mind, write that down. Just sort of, just sort of depict that. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> uh, the next thing I want you to visualize is in your field are flowers. So I want you to add flowers to your field. I'm not going to define what kind of flowers they are. And, uh, you know, probably the, whatever kind of field you have would determine what kind of flowers you have, but how many are there? What, what size are they? Where are they? So just add some flowers to your field. If you don't have time to, to get all, you know, art, artsy, then just, just know what, you, what your intent was by what you did, okay? The last thing is, uh, I want you to visualize a storm brewing somewhere near in your picture, somewhere, a storm. So depict a storm, you know, whatever you guys, you know, you, you said you pray for storms. Come on. I know, you, I know all about that. You, you know what storms are. So there's a storm brewing. And I want that you to include that on your thing. Okay. I'm going to just go through this definition and show, and show you an example here real quick. The cube um, is, is you. The cube is your personality. Is it translucent? If it is, it means that, that you're easy to see through and, uh, which is good. You're transparent. Uh, is it, is it rigid? Is it, does it have a soft exterior? Is it, uh, and where is, is it floating in the air? Is it on the ground? Because it, it makes a difference. If it's, if it's on the ground, it may, it typically indicates that you're grounded. If it's floating in the air, 
then you've got some some decisions to make and there, there's some things that are not quite settled the uh transparency shows you shows you how open you are with people um the size of the cube is the size of your ego so some of you probably filled the whole page up with the cube I'm, i know how that works but the fact is it is impossible for us in our lives to not express who we are impossible by what we say how we dress what we do where we go how we drive we express that and when we do an exercise like this it comes out to some extent all right the ladder is next what's a ladder made of is it sturdy is it wood is it metal is it aluminum uh, is it black is it brown is it a frame you know and where is it is it against the cube if, if it's against the cube the, the ladder by the way is, is is your is how you relate to people and uh your people and uh, your bond to people if uh if you see your success uh dependent upon other people then almost always the the ladder is up, leaning up against the cube if, you, if your ladder is floating in the air it means that you're that uh that you're not sure um you know how if the relationships you have are going to be profitable for what your pursuits and your goals are in life there's a lot more to it than that and i really don't have time to get into it the horses are interesting um uh, what's how far is a horse from the cube the horse is your significant other so how far is it away is it a part of your of your life and your goals which is what the ladder represents or is it far away is it going in the opposite direction leaving you in its in its dust is it is it facing you is it wagging its head at you does it have a saddle on it so you can and a bridle so you can control it uh is it is it brown or black i mean what what is it and uh anyway those things that represents your significant other in your life and how they relate to whatever your goals are in life the flowers almost always represent um what you want to happen with uh with fruitfulness in your life particularly children and um, one of the things that they they discovered doing this test is that um people who do lots and lots of flowers really want lots and lots of children now that's not the only thing this could be other peripheral people in your life uh, do, do, if you only have one flower and it's wilted in your you know in your in your thing you may have a problem with people i understand that and uh and that's what it's supposed to represent the last thing is the storm the storm represents a challenge you have in your life is it close is it raining on your cube is it way off in the distance is there lightning uh, you know is it is it foreboding is or is it leaving is it good is it now is it now gone this represents a challenge you have in your life and uh and how you are responding to that so that's just just a quick you know understanding of it this is a picture that a psychologist did after somebody took the cube test he had an artist recreate this and this is what they came up with and this is given to the to the counselee um to show where they were when they took the cube test I just want to point a few things out. This is very interesting. Just to give you an example. Uh, the first thing is, if you'll notice the cube, you see, and I'll point, you notice the cube is, is like a child's building block. It has a number on it and it has cats. And um, so I've done a lot with hoarding, hoarding resolution. I, I've worked with the Hoarders TV show. Believe me, I know cats. And, um, and this person is a cat person, but they're also a child even though they're, they're in their forties, the one who did this in their forties. And so their cue, their whole, their whole orientation, their, their personality is childlike. It's a cue. And next to the cue, by the way, there's something under the cube. I'm not sure it fell in the Wicked Witch of the West or what, you know, what it was, but next to the cube is a ladder very close to it. What kind of ladder is that? When I got to looking at that and I said, you know what that ladder reminds me of? You ever go to a football game? And, uh, and the, there's the band <clears throat> and they, they, they're performing and the, the band leader, the, the drum major, or even the, the, whoever the, who's head of the band climbs up the ladder and directs. So this, this person, uh, their, their goals are really directed by somebody else. That's, that's what that ladder to me seems to mean. The next thing is the horse. I want you to notice that's not a horse. <laughs> that's a unicorn. That's what a child would put down. This person's significant other was a figment of their imagination. And, um, and I, I'm not sharing this to be critical about anybody because we're all different places, but it helps us understand who we are. And part of part of sitting in the channel is we have to know who we are and how we respond to certain situations. And then the other thing is the flowers. She has two, 
I say she, I think it was a female. She has two flowers and uh, each flower, each one has four, I think, or maybe five, I can't quite tell. But uh, she, she wants to have other people in her life and she may even want to have children. She may already have children, I, I don't know. But, but at least it wasn't one wilted flower over in the corner, you know, that says something. And then notice the, the storm. Uh, she, didn't ha- she didn't have one cloud, she had three clouds. And they were, they were full of lightning, and, uh, which is very interesting. And you can't tell if they're coming or going, but it looks like they're coming because lightning always happens at the beginning of a storm. And so it's like this, it's coming this way. So she has some things that she was scared of that she was facing. But I want you to know some a couple of interesting things. She added birds in the picture. Um, she wasn't asked to do that. And the other thing was she added a tree. And a uh, tree gives two things. This uh, coconut tree, palm tree, coconut palm, it has shelter and sustenance. And so there, there is somebody in her life that she was depending on to, to meet her needs besides herself. And uh, so that's just a little, that's a cube test. There's a whole lot more to it than that. But trust me, the, our perceptions about ourselves are very important because in our environment, we have a perception of how people relate to us and, and how we fit into, into uh, society. And that perception, and by, by the way, I noticed the, 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 uh, on the wall, I said perception is, is, uh, is to say more important than reality. Perception is greater than reality. That is true because that governs you. And so perception makes us make a cognitive decision about how to relate to people, about, about what to do, where to go, what decisions to make. And then that decision brings an action and that action affects our environment. And so it's a, it's a circle that goes round and round. Perceptions are very important. So you need to, we need to know about ourselves. We need to be just like uh, Mark Twain and take a measurement and see how we are, especially in relation to, uh, to the channel. We project our biggest uh, problems and needs and fears and pains on society. When you see that, what do you see? The first thing people see is a, is a, is a, a man, but I was doing this at a conference and this girl yells out, liar! And I went, turn your head slightly to the right and you can see that it says liar. She saw that before anybody else did. So I had a chance to ask her after class, why did you yell out liar? She goes, because somebody, somebody just broke my heart and he lied to me. I said, whoa, we, we project our, our feelings and pains and, and where we are. Here's another one. Um, somebody was asked to do a art piece about Lady Macbeth and who does a soliloquy after the, after the death of the, the uh, King of Denmark. And, um, and she, she was the one who caused the death. And so she, in her soliloquy, she's talking and then she yells out, out damn spot. When we have spots that are there, um, we, will, we will express that. People always express their pain. In my, in my three hour class, I go into depth about that. But the fact is <clears throat> who you are is very important. You need to know who you are uh, for you to be able to maintain the, the channel. And then lastly, is that one woman or one person or two, and are they women? And is it one man, one woman? And, uh, and our, our perceptions color how we see things, just, just saying, that's what it is. Okay, the third thing, we're almost done. The third thing is that we have to be able to appreciate other people and where they're coming from. We're all in process here. We all have needs. We all have cubes and ladders and, and horses and, and flowers and storms. We all have that. We need to appreciate what other people are coming from. And, um, and so if I show you that, what is that right there? Jeremiah, can you see that? What is that? It is a frog until you turn it sideways. And then it's a horse. So which is it? Well, it depends on your perspe- pers- you know, perspective. Well, our perspectives are always different than somebody else's. And you've got to learn to appreciate where other people are coming from. Another, another great quote from Socrates, Socrates, strong minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, weak minds discuss people. One of the ways you can tell if you, if you, if you have issues in your life that are unresolved is you will be a constant, uh, constantly critical of other people and pointing things out and, uh, and, and other things as well, anger and other things. The fourth thing is that we, a person should always practice thankfulness and giving. I, I can't tell you, in, in my, I have a class on customer service, and I go really go into depth about that. But the fact is that we need to learn to be thankful. 
but it's not enough to be thankful. We need to express thankfulness. When's the last time you expressed to somebody who's benefited you that you were thankful for them in your life? It's a very important attribute to have. I wish I could wave a magic wand and make everybody have that, you know, the, the, uh, the attribute of, of gratitude, but they don't. And the other thing is giving. Only when we give out um, do we really uh, take in. And, uh, and so uh, it's a discipline that all of us should learn. The last thing is let go. So I'm gonna show you this and we'll end with this. Uh, that's a monkey, as you can tell. And that is in Borneo. In Borneo, the way they trap monkeys is they take a coconut, cut a hole in it, take, take uh, the, the juice and pulp out, fill it back with berries and some of the pulp and mix it all together, where it's very enticing to a monkey, chain the coconut to a tree, and then just lay the coconut down. Monkeys are very inquisitive. They have a very good sense of smell, and they will hop down there and check that out. And they go, oh, boy, and they stick their hand in the coconut and grab a hold of all those delicious things inside. And when they make a fist, they can't get their hand out. And the point being is, if you hold on to the wrong things that you're after, that it will trap you. And you've got to be able to let go to go down channel. So in my, in my remarkable and humble opinion, here's, how, here's the gist of this little class. It's not what you know that makes for proper ethics, it's what you are and how you relate to other people how you captain your ship. So I'm going to show you two pictures that are cute. This is a fire. This is this is back in the 60s. This, this is a school and uh, that was on fire. And uh, but there, but this is the championship football game. I want you to notice the school's on fire. But everybody's watching the football game, except for one person, the arsonist. So take just understand what you focus on is very important. Uh, arsonists can't stop you. Problems cannot stop you. People can't stop you. Only you can stop you. You are the captain of your ship. And uh, that's that's the class on navigating the ethics. I'll turn it back over to David. Wow. Thank you, Terry. That's I'm interested to see the three hour course if that's the free abbreviated version. There's more jokes in that. Yeah. Really... <laughs> I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I took some notes. Um, you know, one of the things um, you pointed out, first of all, was uh, the number one complaint with the Department of Insurance is customer service, um, which I, I agree with that, just based on my experience. And, and you said it's all about how you treat people and going back to the moral code. Um, the analogy of the Mississippi River and all the uh, tributaries that, you know, was the makeup that that was that uh, made sense. I guess it, it brought it back you know, as far as doing that. Um, you also said that you said, you know, you probably never read the insurance code. Uh, to me, you know, that said it is, it's true. I mean, as an adjuster, if you can relate it to the policyholder, I mean, how many policyholders actually read their policy, right? Uh, right. So kind of relate that to, you know, they're depending on us to teach them, guide them and do the right thing and, you know, take care of them. So that was, that was uh, very good. The, the river bank, you know, it, it changes courses, uh, courses and uh, adapting to it accordingly you know that's that was uh, good for me the the q test i'm gonna have to uh i'm not gonna share my results with you about that. but uh the tributary you know the five things tributaries that makes us who we are uh that was really uh informational and the river channel the instructions you know to try to knock you off course and you always stay the course and, and overcome those obstacles it was very very uh information. Well, I appreciate it. Good. Uh, Julie, Ashley, do you have any questions that uh, we can? Yes, we do. Let's let the very first one that we had pop up was just kind of general. Would you do the right thing if no one was watching? Great question. <laughs> Did you hear that? Would you do the right thing if no one was watching? That's what integrity is. And that's, that's what you're expected to do. That's right. Let's see, we've got a story from Tom here. Uh, a policyholder complained because his car leaked oil in the driveway um, and he tried to explain to them as an adjuster. He couldn't fix the car, but they were still upset. Um, how could you handle that situation better um, so the policyholder understands you? Did you hear the question? 
somebody had oil leaking from a car and they want they wanted the insurance company to do that. And I always use the law of large numbers to try to express to them how much money you reckon you paid for your car insurance. Or or hey, life insurance is one of the big ones. You know, I don't pay a whole lot of money for life insurance. And um, if if I take a policy out and I don't kill myself in the first two years, then my wife, who's a beneficiary, gets a whole lot of money. But I'm only gonna put in a little bit of money. How is that possible? And the, the fact is we all put our money into a pool. We're all in this together. We it's called the law of, the law of large numbers. And uh, and policyholders always ask, hey, how come, you know, I want this and this and this. And we had one when I was I was an adjuster, had asked the guy, how, mu how much you reckon you put into your uh, policy over these past 10 years? You see, you had this policy for 10 years. And we talked about that. I said, you're getting ready to get 10 times that. How is that even possible? And uh, it's the law of large numbers. You know, we're all of this together. So there has to be some way for us to define, you know, what is covered and what's not covered. That's the policy. And when you when you sign that policy, you sign a contract to uh, to abide by that. And so some things are not covered. I'm I'm sorry, I didn't write the policy. You signed it. <laughs> and uh, and so you, you you can be gentle with somebody like that, but there, there's always an expectation uh, to take advantage of the insurance. Yeah. obviously and you and you're running in the middle of that i think that goes back to one of the um the five things when you said of being a good captain is appreciate other situations you know i always <clears throat> excuse me i always try to when i'm talking to folks is put yourself in their shoes you know have they ever filed a claim before and what would you expect what would you want to know and kind of relate to them that way and, and of course I'm always doing the right thing but but be personable not just sound like a robot Spit the policy out and just that's it you know nothing else to say um any more no go ahead okay. Okay. all right um again thanks for for being here i thanks appreciate it i know i know everybody uh liked it as well i've got a lot of takeaways from it so um you know we appreciate you doing this and, and being here and um if you want to go to our website it's stevens engineering is s it's Stevens with a PH. It's going to be spelling it. StevensEngineering.com forward slash education. And we have a way to sign up for our upcoming classes. Then we go into great depth about these things. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Or more depth. Not right. great. But. Right. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, that's uh, that concludes this uh, episode. So uh, thank you guys for, for joining. And we will see you in two weeks.